Well, how are we today? This is Christianity and Ethics, Religious Studies 3396. And for the last uh, couple of times, we've been talking about such concepts as the image of God. The image of God is a uh, concept which involves also discussions of things like idolatry, uh, the doctrine of sin, particularly uh, the old traditional expression, original sin, which has become very problematic in the modern world. But uh, let me just review a little bit about what we did last time in terms of the image of God before we start talking about sin. As we said last time, there are two types of theory regarding the image of God. And they may first be distinguished. Uh, two ways of thinking about man according to which may be classified most of traditional discussions about human nature. One view singles out something within the substantial form of human nature. Some faculty or capacity human beings possess and identifies this as the thing which distinguishes a human being from physical nature and from other animals. Now this, this concept of the image of God in man uh, originates primarily in our culture in Greek philosophy, primarily in philosophies such as Platonism and Neoplatonism. And it usually expresses itself through the concept of the divine spark. That's really a stoic expression. But the divine star spark is something that's inside human beings uh, substantially because human beings exist. Uh, they have within themselves a divine spark which is not um, derived from human beings themselves, existing human beings, but is something that is substantially poured into them uh, from God. In other words, the divine spark is divine. The divine spark is a part of God that still exists in human nature. <coughs> and it's spoken of primarily in terms of the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Now, the image of God in man is, uh, even though not many people hear a discussion of this subject, has been a vital issue in the history of Western thought, particularly since the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. But even in the Middle Ages, the concept of the image of man was, was primarily linked to Greek concepts of substantiality. In other words, human beings um, have uh, 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 human beings, like everything else, are made up of substance and accidents. Accidents are things that we see and feel and hear and so forth. Substance is that which is at the essence of everything. Now, you cannot, even a medieval theologian, cannot consider the substance of the image of God in human beings to be a divine substance. That is. Uh, they cannot consider it to be divinity itself. In order to get a concept of the divine substance being God himself, you have to go back to Plato or to Neoplatonism or to Stoicism or to Hinduism or some, some place like that. So even the medieval people, when they believed in the immortality of the soul, did not believe the same thing about the soul as uh, Neoplatonists did. They always had to, as I said last time, draw a line between God and human beings. That doesn't mean just drawing a line between God and human bodies, which of course is uh, one of the first lines you, you should draw. But as I said last time, the image of God in human beings from the biblical perspective is not what human beings look like. Human beings look more like chimpanzees than they do God, if you're talking about uh, physical image. Uh, human beings have very close DNA kinship with, uh, with all animals, and uh, some animals more than others. But that's not, 
that's not where we're going, that is in some kind of physical substance in human beings, to find out what the image of God is. And so the tendency then is to go to a, quote, spiritual substance. That is, if you want to find the image of God, you have to go deeper than the physical, which is kind of uh, obvious. But when you go deeper than the physical, in order to find a, a substance in human beings, which is the image of God, then you usually come up with the idea of the soul. And there's a lot on the spirit, and there's a lot being said these days about spirituality. And a lot being said these days about spirituality uh, is not a uh, revival of the biblical understanding of the spirit or of the spiritual. It is a, it's a revival instead of uh, ancient Greek and uh, Eastern or Oriental conceptions of the soul and the spirit, in which the soul and the spirit itself participates in the divine, is divine. Whereas in the Bible, just as you, di just as you have to draw a line between God and human beings in terms of physical relationship, you also have to divide between human beings and God in terms of substance. In other words, human beings, even a human soul, is not the same substance with God. And in fact, the human soul, the human spirit, is not even spoken of in terms of substance in the Bible. Substance is an Aristotelian term. It is a Platonistic term. So the Bible doesn't even speak in those terms. To give you an example of the use of substantial language in the Middle Ages, uh, one example is the, is the concept of transubstantiation. You ever heard of that idea? Transubstantiation. In the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Eucharist is uh, participated in, in fact it's required that, uh, that good Catholics participate in the Eucharist fairly often. The Eucharist is a time when, according to Catholic doctrine, people actually meet together and the priest consecrates bread and wine and the bread becomes in some way the body of Christ and the wine in some way becomes the uh, blood of Christ. Well, this is a substantialist conception of the Eucharist. Um, the New Testament uses language such as Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. But uh, it, it's been left up, in a sense, to later, church, later ages for the church to interpret this language in Aristotelian and Platonic and other kinds of language. So according to the doctrine of transubstantiation, which means substance crossing over, trans means to cross over, substance. What happens when a particular moment comes in the Eucharist, uh, a priest pronounces and a bell rings and the substance of the bread changes un un into the substance of the body of Christ. Now, uh, everything else looks the same because there's a difference between substance and accidents. The accidents mean that the bread looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it smells like bread. Everything about it that we can perceive with our senses, the accidents are the same. But the substance supposedly changes. Well, that's a use of a philosophical conception, the, the conception of substantiality, to try to explain biblical language which is not explained. Uh, that's not the way, for instance, Jesus or Paul would have explained the Eucharist because they were not Aristotelian, <laughs> and so they did not use that kind of language. Paul undoubtedly believed that in some real sense, when the Eucharist was partaken of, Christ was present. But in terms of his body and also in terms of his blood as the symbolic, uh, as symbolic of his cleansing of sin. And so in the Eucharist, all the way through Christian history, 
the idea has been held that uh, Christ is present in some way in the Eucharist. Probably if you're thinking in Jewish terms, as Jesus and Paul uh, would have been thinking, the presence of Christ was probably thought of more in terms of Christ being present at the table with you, eating with you. And so, uh, but in Paul, there is a little bit of a mystical conception in that he says that when we eat the bread, we participate in the body of Christ. When we eat the, when we drink the wine, we participate in the blood of Christ. But again, the, the language of substance and accidents is not found. Well, this language of substance and accidents is very natural in medieval thought because uh, the human being uh, was uh, understood in substantial terms. And uh, that is that, that uh, there are accidents about a human being, that is the way he looks, his physical body and so forth, but the real substance of the human being is an immortal soul. But as I say, even in medieval theology, which is, which is, is at least biblical to this extent, the soul cannot be identified with God. The soul may reach out to try to have a relationship with God, but the soul cannot be identified with God. But anyway, Christianity was left with the idea that the only important thing about a human being from the perspective of God, the only really important thing is his soul. And that's kind of left over from the Stoic and Platonic idea that the soul of the human being is divine or is God. So we can't, we can't accuse medieval theology of identifying the soul with God. Uh, a lot of modern spirituality does that, but that's not really the view of medieval theology. But we can say that medieval theology focused on the substantiality of the soul. That is, the soul was something substantially real that you could, that you could find uh, within a human being that distinguished him from other animals and uh, made him uh, related to God. So in a sense, the soul of the spirit was the image of God. What Ramsey is trying to say is that, that uh, at least that, that modern theology, including today a lot of Roman Catholic theology, but certainly uh, Protestant theology and Jewish theology, think in terms of, of, uh, of existential reality rather than substantial reality. Or it thinks in terms of relational reality rather than substantial reality. In other words, the image of God appears in man when, when a human being is in a certain relationship. It's not got just kind of sitting there waiting to be discovered. It appears in a human being when a human being is in a kind of relationship. Now, of course, this understanding is dependent upon the, the discovery by a great deal of modern biblical theology that the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is not a biblical idea. If you look at both the Old and the New Testament, for instance, if you got yourself a uh, concordance, you know what a concordance is? If you got yourself a concordance, a concordance is a book that lists all of the words used in the Bible and it shows you where to go to find those words. If you look in that concordance, you will find the word soul and you will find soul uh, used several times in older translations. If, if you're using a modern concordance that is tied to a modern version of the Bible, you may not even find the word soul. Because modern translations of the Bible generally avoid the word soul because the word soul has taken on such a substantialist meaning in our culture that most Bible scholars think it is misleading to use the word soul very much in translating the Bible. For instance, where Jesus says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul in the old King James Version? All, all modern translations say what? Almost all modern translations. What shall a man give in exchange for his life? Because in the Old Testament, 
soul means life. The Hebrew word nefesh means life. And uh, uh, so the, a soul in the Old Testament is a living being. And soul in the Old Testament, therefore, has nothing to do with being a substantial part of God that has been broken off and entrapped in a human physical body. And in fact, it has very little to do with the idea of substance at all. Certainly not immortal substance. Jesus, for instance, one time says, don't be afraid of him who is able to destroy the body alone. But instead, be afraid of him who is able to destroy both body and soul. Well, lots of people go to that passage of scripture to try to prove that the New Testament teaches the immortality of the soul you'll make the point that the Bible doesn't contain the concept of the immortality of the soul and somebody, somebody will immediately go to that passage and oh, well, what about what Jesus says? Jesus says, God is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Well, what, how, is that, how is the word soul defined in that scripture then? It's certainly not immortal. You can't destroy something that's immortal. And so Jesus operates completely oblivious in his teaching and his sayings of the Aristotelian and the Platonic conception of the soul. Uh, certainly he is not anywhere near the concept of the soul being a, a divine spark or a substance of God that is trapped inside a human body. Now, this is one of the major conflicts or tensions that exist today, for instance, between uh, traditional Christianity and modern science. And that's an ironic tension because the rise of the Enlightenment and the rise of modern science actually tried to deflect traditional Christianity from believing in the biblical conception of life after death, that is, resurrection from the dead and deflect it into a belief in the old Platonic or Stoic concept of the immortality of the soul. But once they did that, that is, once all of these Enlightenment philosophers said the, that the doctrine of the resurrection of the body is so primitive and, and ill-conceived that modern people can't believe it anymore. So we now believe in the immortality of the soul. As soon as they got that established, then the next generation or two People said, well, now we can't believe in the immortality of the soul. So by the time uh, a great deal of modern science had uh, developed, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, not only had uh, modern thought, which thinks of the soul as a substantial thing, gotten rid of the resurrection of the body, which is a relational thing. It's, it's not a substantial thing. Uh, once a human being is dead from the biblical perspective, he is dead. There's not a substance left. The only thing left is in the mind of God. And so resurrection means that God recreates human beings to have a relationship with him. Human beings are born to, are, are created to be related to God, but human beings are not immortal substances with which God has to be related whether he likes it or not. Human beings are mortal. So when, uh, when Greek thinkers thought of human beings as, as mortal, they thought of as the, as the human part being only his bodily historical existence. The immortal part was the divine part that had been trapped. And so in order to get back into biblical thinking, uh, we need to go back again behind the transition that took place during the Enlightenment and the rise of modern science to understand that in order to find the soul, in order to understand what the soul is and what the relationship of God to, uh, to human beings are, you're not going to be looking for something inside a human being, uh, either a spiritual substance or a physical substance.
So anyway, uh, the descendants of some of these uh, folks in the 19th and early 20th century who said, we can no longer believe in resurrection. Uh, we can only believe in a kind of a vague notion of immortality, immortality of the soul. And then after their children uh, were raised in a scientific culture, they realized that they had been cutting on people now for a long time. And what had they not found? They had not found the soul. There was no scientific evidence for a soul. Well, that is a devastating blow to some people who have a substantialist view of the soul. But it's not a devastating blow at all to the biblical understanding of the nature of human being. Because the human, human being, including his image of God, is not dependent upon there being a substantial soul. It's dependent on having a relationship. Even the human being's existence depends at every moment on having a relationship to God. The biblical view is if there is no God who wants human beings to exist, they will not exist. And when God uh, takes away his consciousness or interest in a human being, you know, there is no existence. And so from the biblical perspective, uh, human beings did not exist before they got bodies. That's kind of a pagan myth that still permeates a lot of popular thinking. You know, you have these advertisements. I, I've seen an advertisement before where they have these little angels sitting on the shelf. And, uh, and then some, somebody down on earth gets pregnant. And so a little angel is tapped on the shoulder and said, you're next. So the little angel goes down and enters the body. Uh, that's a cute little uh, romantic notion of... Uh, of what a human being is, but that's not the biblical notion. The biblical notion is that human beings were never divine. They never will be divine. They aren't divine now. Not only that, human beings are not angels. They're not immortal spirits that existed before they were created. Human beings are created beings, body, soul, and spirit. So the only time you can talk, from the biblical perspective, the only time you can talk about a person being immortal is when that person is in relationship to God. In fact, Martin Luther says, the minute a human being begins a conversation with God, he becomes immortal. He's not immortal before he comes into conversation with God. He, he becomes immortal only when he, when he comes into conversation with God. And that's what the New Testament means by for instance, uh, in the Gospel of John, eternal life. Eternal life is not, does not mean immortal soul. Eternal life means that eternal, eternal life and immortality is a gift from God. You could be a human being in the physical sense and in the biological sense and in the psychological sense and not have eternal life abiding in you from the biblical perspective. So what we're dealing with in that is, re is relational. And from the biblical perspective, if you don't have eternal life abiding in you right now, you won't have it, have it after you die. In other words, if you are not in, in relationship with God, a relationship with God which, which is characterized by a continuing fellowship, not, a, not an identity. You don't, you're not soaked into God. You're not swallowed by God. You are in fellowship with God because from the biblical perspective, you're a person and God is a person. Now, uh, I've heard scientists, particularly I've heard some doctors who have kind of lost their traditional faith in God. And they'll say something like, well, I've been operating on people all my life, and uh, there's no there's no such thing as a soul. It's kind of like Yuri Gagarin, you know, when he when he went up into space, and he he flew around the Earth, and he says he he announced over the uh, over the intercom system, "Well, there is no God." Well, on what basis was he making that announcement? Well, he's now up in space, and so he can look around, and he doesn't see any God, you know. Well. 
if that's your conception of God, then of course you're not going to find him if you go into space. And if it's your conception of, of, of soul, that it's some kind of substance that can be detected in a human being, either physically or psychologically, then um, that's not the, uh, you're not going to find that either. When a, when a human being is dead, for instance, you're not even going to be able to detect a psyche, which is the Greek word for soul. Uh, you can detect a psyche, I mean, it's a Greek word for life, and it's also used to mean soul, and that's where we get our word psychology and so forth. Psychology is the study of the soul. But uh, the word psyche is used in the New Testament, not in the sense of, a, of an immortal substance, but in the sense of a, uh, of a life that is in relationship. And life that is in relationship may or may not exist. There is a book which um, I mentioned in my science and religion class, which I'm still trying to find. In fact, my daughter spent several weeks last semester trying to find it because I had mentioned it. There's a book that I read when I was at Rice University in the library. It was a little thin book, about that big. And it was a book on the immortality of the soul. And it was a book written by a Presbyterian Scottish minister physician who had begun to lose his faith because of the influence of, en of naturalistic enlightenment thought. And so he was just, he was just uh, frantic at the idea that Christians, the, that the Christian view of human beings would be completely destroyed if he could not find some kind of evidence that would fit scientific criteria that there is a substantial human soul. So he went to London and uh, spent a great deal, he evidently was fairly well off, he spent a great deal of his time working on an experiment. And this experiment was that he would uh, go into people's rooms who were, who were uh, already assumed to be dying and he would get permission from their family to perform an experiment on these people. And the experiment was very simple. He would try to weigh these people um, on a regular basis and try to be there to weigh them the moment they died. So he was on call, you know, 24 hours a day because he wanted to weigh these people the moment they died. They had been put on weighing machines. And so he weighed them the moment they died, and then he weighed them the moment after they died, and he subtracted the weight before they died from the weight after they died. All the weight after they died from the weight before they died. And I forget the exact amount he said that a human soul weighs, but I think it was some like, something like between three and seven milligrams. Uh, and so he wrote his book thinking that he was making a contribution to Christian apologetics, a contribution to Christian uh, proof, scientific proof that Christianity exists. Well, that comes from this substantialist concept. Of course, that's a very primitive and, uh, and uh, non-profound concept conception of substantial soul. Uh, Plato and Aristotle's view are more profound than that. But that's just how drastic a lot of people have become in the 19th, 20th century to try to prove that there's something inside human beings that scientists are missing. And what Ramsey is saying is, if you're a scientist, you're not missing something substantial inside of human beings. Because the image of God that is in relationship to God is not a substance, it's a relationship. So the image of God, again going back to our screen, the image of God is rather to be understood as a relationship within which man sometimes stands whenever like a mirror he obediently reflects God's will in his life and actions. There's even been a recent uh, uh, attempt 
among naturalistic scientists and naturalistic psychiatrists to um, forward the proposition that human beings, that hum human nature is not a substantial thing. And a lot of Christians think that that is a horrible thing because that will knock the props out, out from under Christianity if it, is, if it is shown that human nature is not a substantial thing. Well, it will knock the props out from under certain traditional Christian theologies, but it certainly won't knock the props out of biblical understanding of human nature because the biblical understanding of human nature is human nature is not a substantial thing. Uh, the human, uh, hu human, uh, the image of God is not a substantial thing. It is something that exists only in relationship. The mirror itself is not the image. The mirror images. God's image is in the mirror. So when you look at the image of God in human being, what are you seeing? You're seeing God, just like if you look in a mirror and you uh, see the image, you're seeing yourself. So the, the mirror is there, but God is not there. It's just the image of God. And the image of God only appears when human beings are in a certain kind of relationship and are doing certain things. The image of God, according to this view, consists of man's position before God, or rather the image of God is reflected in man because of his position before him. According to Kierkegaard, the image of God does not exist in man. Man only exists in the image of God. Now transfer that to New Testament language. Um, what does Paul say, how does Paul say human beings are to be related to Christ? Notice this language. Man exists in the image of God. According to the New Testament, Christ is the image of God. So true humanity exists only in Christ. In other words, uh, you've got to get hooked up, hooked up with the image of God as it's expressed in Jesus Christ. So to be, uh, man only exists in the image of God whenever he consents to be nothing through the act of worship. Man is spirit. Spirit is man's invisible glory. And the fact of being able in truth to worship is the superiority of the invisible glory above all creation. The conclusion of every discussion of the image of God among Christians should then be this, according to Ramsey, and you can uh, agree or disagree, but uh, we're, we're following this trail. This term cannot be defined by probing deep into the nature of man physically or psychologically, or by employing some, sub, some sub-Christian sources of insight into what it means to be man. The term, like all other Christian this term, like all other Christian categories, whose meaning we have explored in this book, can be defined only derivatively by decisive reference to the basic primitive idea in Christian ethics. Now, what is the primitive idea or the first principle? Love, which in, it turn, which in its turn can be adequately defined only by indicating Christ Jesus. There again, that's, in, that's that embarrassing uh, particularity. But in order, to, in order to explicate Christian ethics, ethics, you have to have that embarrassing particularity. There's nothing... Uh, unusual about that if you're going to if you're going to uh, if you're going to talk about Buddhist ethics you have to have a kind of a, a uh, embarrassing particularity because Buddhist ethics is going to be different from the ethics of Jesus Christ but Christian ethics is defined only in the context of Jesus Christ so uh, the image of God is related <laughs> It, uh, the image of God in man is not substantial, but it, it has to do with relationship. So when Christ comes, according to the New Testament, he is the image of God, and our relationship 
to God is our relationship that we have to God through Jesus Christ. Because our image is not substantial enough to, to stand up. So the proper relationship, the, the proper love, the proper forgiveness, the proper grace, the, the proper spirit, the proper power uh, that will make, that, that will put us uh, properly uh, in relationship to God and therefore to be the image of God, to, to, to mirror God himself, uh, comes from the Christian perspective and understanding the purpose for the incarnation, the purpose for Christ becoming man. And so, as Paul says, we are in Adam, but in Christ we are in the new Adam. We are made in the image of God, but that image of God is uh, very insubstantial. And it's affected by sin, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Sin, the first assertion Christian ethics makes about man is that he was created for personal existence within the image of God. And that Jesus Christ most perfer perfectly reveals this image. That's what we've been talking about. But the second assertion about Christian ethics, or the second assertion that Christian ethics makes about man is that man is sinful. And that is the one that, that just uh, uh, throws people into, <laughs> into fits. To talk about, in, mo in the modern world, to talk about sin. Because sin is so totally misunderstood as to what it means in, in Christian ethics. Um, Sin, it must be pointed out, first of all, is something a man does, not something he suffers. There are all kinds of evil that human beings suffer. But this evil is not what separates him from God. Kinds of evil that human beings suffer may be a result of man's separation from God. But what separates human being from God is what he does. His, its locus is within the will of man, within the human spirit itself. Sin is a man's own act, not the effect of some influence upon him. Lots of people, for instance, think they're making fun of the Christian doctrine of sin when they say, the devil made me do it. Well, uh, that is not a Christian idea, that the devil made me do it. There is a Christian concept of the devil. There is a Christian concept of Satan. There is a Christian concept of temptation. But there is no Christian concept that the devil made me do it. So when any Christian uses that as an excuse, they're not taking responsibility for their own sin. That's what happened in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. What happened in the third chapter of the book of Genesis? Adam and Eve broke, turned away from God, therefore broke their relationship with God, and therefore the image of God within which they were living was distorted. And God confronts them, and they're feeling naked. Being naked is not sinful, but feeling naked and being ashamed is the result of being improperly related to God. So they, they feel like they're naked and they want to hide from God and God says, well, who told you were naked? Well, what does Adam say? Well, it was the woman. If, we, if I hadn't had that woman, I'd still be on top. <laughs> if I hadn't had that woman, I'd still be going strong. So God goes to the woman. And the woman is not the worst sinner in the book of Genesis, but she's not any less a sinner than the man. And so the woman says, no, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. So it's amazing that the, that the basic document of uh, Jewish and Christian religion uh, tells us that one of, the, one of the, I guess the second sin that human beings committed was blaming somebody else for their sin.
So sin is a man's own act, not the, the effect of some influence on him. This must be kept clear even when we learn to regard sin as a deeply inward spiritual act or pattern of activity, and no longer simply as some particular infraction of a known moral law or a series of such infractions. Now that's important, because there's a difference between uh, the doctrine of sin and moralism. Now let me try to give you an illustration. This is just an illustration. It's just a, uh, an analogy. And like all analogies, it doesn't fit everything. But when I was growing up, Christians did not have, American Christians, did not have a very good plan for dealing with alcoholics in their communities. What do you suppose the plan was <laughs> if, if, if an alcoholic turned up in a church? What generally was the plan? Well, the plan was to uh, go to him and, uh, and uh, declare him to be a sinner and shame him and get him to quit drinking. For some reason, they couldn't figure out, didn't work. It worked sometimes. I knew one man when I was a child who was an alcoholic who just got up one morning after getting up a mo one morning for a million times. <laughs> he got up one morning and decided, I'm not going to drink again, and he never did the rest of his life. He was an impossible person to live with because he was so self-righteous, because he had managed to do it himself, that he actually made other people's lives miserable, for instance, uh, uh, he had a friend, a very close friend, who's, uh, who had a, a bottle of whiskey in his, uh, in his cupboard that, he, that the doctor had told him to take a little bit every night. You know, doctors uh, always tried to help their patients out who wanted a little whiskey every night, so they, they prescribed it. And he just made that man's life miserable. In other words, he had been an alcoholic, had destroyed his family, had made his children into people who could not function in life. And yet because of his great moral ability of quitting one day, he made other people's lives miserable. Well, that's just uh, self-righteousness. In other words, that's which is worse, the sin of drinking alcohol uh, in an, in an ir irresponsible way are being a self-righteous twit who goes around and makes people feel miserable. You, you just have to decide that. But anyway, a lot of Christians did, know, un, did not understand how to deal with an alcoholic. As a result, they didn't really understand how to deal with other members of the community whose problems were different from the alcoholic. But the alcoholic was somebody that stood out. You know, if you, if you go down the street and you see him lying in the gutter, as a Christian, uh, people thought, well, you can just say, tut, 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 you know. If that guy would just get up and straighten himself out, then he'd be welcome back to church. Well, uh, that is moralism. It doesn't take into account the biblical conception of the universality of sin. That's not to justify the alcoholic's way of life. It's to try to understand it. What are its ultimate causes? His ultimate, the ultimate causes of alcoholism uh, are somewhere, are somehow located in the human being, human being's inability, weakness in making, taking responsibility. But alcoholism also contains other elements. It contains, for instance, a uh, biological, physical, medical element. And so that means that uh, a alcoholic is not necessarily weaker than a non-alcoholic. An alcoholic may be 
uh, may be suffering from some kind of medical predisposition or genetic predisposition or something else. He also may have involved in his life story uh, other uh, events, traumas, abuses that, have, that contribute to his, to his disposition to be an alcoholic. But he is just, he's just such an extravagant example that sometimes moralistic Christians assume that he's a worse sinner than I am. And so they, they had no resources then to help him. And that's the reason why AA, that was, which was established by two theologians, one a Roman Catholic priest and another a Protestant, uh, approached AA in a different way. It approached it basically in a Pauline way. And as a result, Alcoholics Anonymous is the most ex most successful. It's more successful than, for instance, uh, secular uh, psychology or secular counseling or psychoanalysis. Uh, AA is the most successful source for helping people that are alcoholics. First of all, because it it does not absolve people of their own responsibility. But second, it recognizes that a person cannot overcome his sin just by being responsible. It's hard work. You can't just get up in the morning and say, I'm not going to be an alcoholic anymore. In fact, from the AA perspective, you will still be an alcoholic till the day you die. And every time you go to an AA meeting, you're going to have to admit, you're going to have to confess, I am an alcoholic. But all of that is for the purpose of recognizing the responsibility or my responsibility for my life. And taking responsibility for my life as an alcoholic may at least on the surface be a much tougher thing uh, than if I'm not an alcoholic. That doesn't take into consideration that uh, just because when, when you get drunk, you fall down in the street. Other kinds of sin, you don't fall down in the street. You just keep going. <laughs> and you look like you're in good shape. And you look like you're, uh, you've got everything under control until somebody uh, uh, finds you uh, lying in your room with a gun in your hand. You know. there, are all kinds of, there are all kinds of ways in which our separatedness from God our alienation from God, which means alienation from ourselves, plays itself out. And alcoholism, uh, drug, drug addiction, things like this are just some of the more extravagant and, uh, and uh, newsworthy kinds of ways. But that's the reason why Christ, the Christian understanding of sin should always contain within it the concept of universality. The Puritans said in their little school book, in Adam's sin, we sinned all. Well, that is the kind of statement from which the idea of, our, of original sin comes. In Adam's sin, we sinned all. That does not mean that because Adam was a stupid man who did something wrong, we are made sinners. We are sinners because we are sinners. We're not sinners because Adam was a sinner. But, but we are born, as the Old Testament puts it, in sin. In other words, we're, we're talking about relationship. We're talking about relationship. We are born in sin. We're born into a whole context in which sin is a, uh, is a reality. But sin is not a reality because God has commanded sin or because God has created sin. Sin is a reality because it results from human beings uh, distorting their proper relationship with God. So sin is not just an infraction, some particular infraction of moral law. Uh, as, uh, as some theologians have put it, you do not become a thief by stealing. You steal because you're a thief. In other words, there's already some responsibility that you have to take for some prior 
misrelationship, messed up relationship before the act of uh, stealing actually arises. So by criticizing both the moralistic and the traditional definitions of the meaning of sin, Christian ethics in the present day should try to understand sin both as man's own doing and as a dynamic structure or pattern or orientation within man's activity which goes to the root of his existence as a spirit or as a person. To speak of sin as original means that it originates in man himself by his own will and cannot be traced away from man to find its origin in something man suffers or in some superficial aspect of his person. Now some materialists, uh, psychological materialists, uh, legal materialists, have tried particularly in, uh, in Europe and in this country and in Canada, to try to um, uh, defend some people in such a way as to make the law uh, not to recognize any responsibility in human beings merely because they're human beings. For instance, uh, uh, Clarence Darrow in some of his trials uh, he didn't defend people who did not do what they were accused of doing. For instance, when he defended Leopold and Loeb, who were Canadian uh, kids that had uh, murdered a little boy, and they just planned to murder the little boy in order to show that they were of superior intelligence and that they uh, could get away with it. Well, they were of superior intelligence, but, uh, but they, they didn't get away with it. So uh, Clarence Darrow was called in to defend them. And his primary methodology in all of his trials, particularly the death penalty, his primary objective was to get the kids, or whoever, the, whoever it was, uh, to not be sentenced to the death penalty. But his methodology was to try to convince every jury that nobody was ever responsible for what he did to the extent that you, could, that you could put the death penalty on the person. Because the death penalty was punishment for something that somebody was responsible for doing. And so why were these kids not responsible for what they did? Because they were poor little rich kids who were spoiled and who were always uh, bragged on as being brilliant and intelligent and yet they were never given any kind of moral instruction or moral uh, uh, substance in their lives. And so they should not be held responsible for what they did. Now, if the kid was not rich, then what would be the argument? Well, this kid doesn't have the advantages of all these other kids who haven't robbed grocery stores. This kid was born into poverty. He was abused and so forth, and so he has no responsibility for what he did. I don't know that uh, Clarence Darrow actually believed that philosophically, but uh, that was his legal methodology for trying to get people off. And the fact of the matter is that um, um, uh, that, is, that is the ultimate goal of some materialistic, or that's the ultimate outcome of some materialistic understanding of human beings that there is no, there really is no such thing as freedom of the will. There, is, there really is no such thing as human dignity. And so we just have to try to understand that and, and change our legal system to fit that reality. Well, there is some truth to that. Christianity has always recognized that there's some truth to that. That is, that we are caught. Human beings are caught. And there's no doubt that if a, if a child is abused when he's a small child, then that's going to make it very difficult for him to love. That's going to make it very difficult for him to act appropriately in various situations. But somehow or another, Ramsey says, if we're going to 
have a society in which the image of God can appear at all and which love can appear at all, we have to hold ourselves responsible. So even if I'm an alcoholic and can prove that I'm an alcoholic because my daddy was one, that doesn't mean that I don't have responsibility for not beating up my children. I still have the responsibility not to beat up my children. There may be lots of reasons back there I can give, and everybody who beats up his children has reasons why he did it. But somehow or another, the buck has got to stop, as, as the guy says. And, how, and no matter how difficult it is, for instance, to overcome um, drug addiction or to overcome alcoholism or to overcome... Uh, gambling addiction or to overcome any other kind of addiction. You know, the list of addictions is, uh, it can fill up a big book these days. And a lot of Christians say, well, that's just nonsense, calling something an addiction. Well, why is that nonsense? Uh, there are addictions. But that doesn't necessarily take away people's responsibility for their own lives and for dealing with their addiction. There are psychological reasons why a man would beat up his wife. A person who was completely healthy wouldn't beat up his wife. A person who's completely healthy wouldn't kill his children. So, but when, but when you go to court or when you try to judge a person's actions in terms of, of uh, a moral society, you can't just say, well, tell us your reasons. And after we hear your reasons, uh, we can just let you go. Because that's irresponsible. It's not only irresponsible of the person who blames everything else for his hurting somebody, but it's irresponsible of a community. And it's even irresponsible of the church. The church, the church cannot be moralistic and judge and condemn alcoholic people, but it also cannot just say, well, he's an alcoholic, therefore he's not responsible for anything that he does. Because that's not being fair to the people that he's beating up. To speak, to speak of sin as original means that it originates in man himself by his own will, cannot be traced away from man to find its origin in something man suffers or in some superficial aspect of his person. The second thing that should be said concerning the Christian understanding of sin is that this is no ad hoc judgment upon man rendered in some moment of gloom by theologians who should be psychoanalyzed instead of being believed. And that's, what, that, that's kind of the feeling a lot of modern people have about even the use of the word sin, particularly the use of original sin. That it's just a, it's just a, a throwback to a uh, totally demonic or... Uh, our primitive understanding of the nature of human beings and that modern people should have a much more optimistic and utopian conception of what a human being is. We don't have any more optimistic and utopian events in the 21st century, but, uh, but we still should uh, think of human beings as uh, substantially good. Again, that, there's the word substantial again. It's quite possible for a Christian theologian to use that language. For instance, Paul Tillich does. He says human beings are essentially good. Wonderful. But human beings are existentially evil. Which means that you can be walking down the street and you can meet a human being who is essentially good. That is, he was created good by God. And he may take your head off which means that existentially you didn't get any benefit from him being essentially good. And the same thing is true in human history. It may be true, as, uh, as uh, a great many modern people want us to believe, that all human beings are essentially good and, and a lot of people think that the only problem with human beings is that they're religious and if you just get rid of their religion, you just get rid of their shame, you just get rid of their sense of guilt, then there won't be any problems. There's a great deal of confusion these days between real guilt and psychological guilt. 
The fact of the matter is that Adolf Hitler was really guilty. Now, he may have been really guilty because he had a great deal of psychological guilt, which was not real guilt. In other words, his grandmother or his mother, I don't know who, may have abused him, may have uh, given him such a horrible view of existence and a horrible view of life that it, it might be expected that Hitler would turn out the way he turned out. But that doesn't mean we just say, Adolf, I'm okay, you're okay. He is still guilty, and he should be held accountable for his guilt. And uh, if he has psychological guilt, then perhaps some psychological help might be made available to him. If some psychological help might been, had been made available to him when he was 10 years old, maybe we never would have heard of Adolf Hitler. Or if his mother had treated him right when he was 2 years old, we may never have heard of Adolf Hitler. But we did hear of Adolf Hitler. And when we get Hitler, if we had gotten Hitler into our grasp, it would have been immoral to say, well, Adolf, I understand. What you did was just natural. It was just, it was just the natural result of your experience. Uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't responsibly deal with the problem. Now, you may not want to shoot Hitler. You know, the death penalty is another subject altogether. But you also do not want to assume that Hitler or anyone like him is not responsible for who he is and what he does. And Hitler is just one of those extreme people that makes the newspapers. All of us have the same problem to different degrees. That is, all of us have a tendency under certain circumstances to hurt other people. We don't hurt other people the way Hitler does. But again, we can't be self-righteous about that. Because under some circumstances, we might. Have you noticed that every time uh, a uh, child is uh, a serial child molester or a, a serial killer is, uh, is found, most of the people who have anything to do with them might think, oh well, maybe sometimes he was a little weird, but he wouldn't do anything like that. Or uh, even worse, he was just a wonderful man. He loved children. Well, Unfortunately, that's one of, the, one of the things you have to look for when you're looking out for child molesters is people who love children. They are the ones uh, who have some reason sometimes to misuse children. Now, that's hard on the rest of us who love children who don't misuse them. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, we have to understand that we're all in the same boat. And a child molester should not be uh, tortured and hacked to death because he's a sinner any more than we should be tortured and hacked to death because we are a sinner, even though he may need to be kept away from children and he may need to be kept away from everybody else. So keeping a child molester away from children, keeping him away from everybody else that he might hurt, is not cruel and unusual punishment because society has to take responsibility for its responsibility. Human beings have to take responsibility for their responsibility. So it's quite possible to be in favor of very long prison sentences for people uh, who, we, who we might feel for and who we, not, who we may not be in favor of killing by capital punishment but we still understand that the human condition is such that we would actually be irresponsible and we would be contributing to the hurting of other people if we didn't isolate them. So this is a very complex thing, you know, when you talk about human misery and human sin. Um, but, but when theologians talk about it, they're not just being gloomy. 
They're trying to comprehend what everybody sees every day in the newspaper. It is rather a conclusion to which Christian thought is forced from viewing man in the light of God as Christians know him. That is, in Jesus Christ. At the deepest level, the doctrine of sin has least to do with mankind in general and most to do with oneself in particular. No Christian has a right, from the biblical perspective, to call another person a sinner unless he understands himself to be a sinner. If you want to be miserable, uh, try to be a part of a Christian community or a church in which the preacher doesn't think he's a sinner. Among other things, that person will make you miserable. I don't want to be in a church where there, where there's, where there are no sinners. I don't want to be in a church where there's someone who doesn't know that he's a sinner. But it's impossible to be in a church where that doesn't happen. So you just have to take the bad with the good. But at the deepest level, the doctrine of sin has less to do with mankind in general and most to do with oneself in particular. It amounts to confession prompted by viewing oneself in the mirror of the Word of God. Uh, one of the basic ways in which sin is described in the Bible is idolatry. Now, idolatry, since it's a different word from sin, we sometimes kind of separate it out and think of it as a different thing. But in the biblical perspective, idolatry is not a different thing from sin. It is sin. It's, it's one way of talking about sin. According to the Bible, rebellion against God does not simply take the form of specific disobedient acts, and these alone. Nor does sin ordinarily take the form of rebellion so utterly defiant or despairing as to break all connection with the divine. Instead, sin always assumes the guise of idolatry or adopting some other religious orientation that, that worship, than worship the true God. This notion of idolatry is a religious and at the same time also an ethical category. The origin of sin, certainly the nature of sin, is revealed most clearly in the fact that the human spirit, in its self-transcendence and freedom, with overwhelming probability, centers itself upon itself, centers itself upon itself in the guise of some idol rather than in faith living for one another. That refers us back to, you remember we were talking about Augustine, Augustine talking about the basic sin is pride. You might say, well, when are these Christian theologians going to decide? Is sin sin, or is it pride, or is it idolatry, or in the case of Luther, unbelief? The answer to that is yes, that's what sin is. It is, it is idolatry, that is, it's inordinately self-centered upon oneself and if you're inordinately self-centered upon yourself then who is God? Who is God for you? You are. And if I am God I, uh, I might make a pretty good human being you know I'll have to leave that up to other people but I make a lousy God and when I, when I am seen in my actions and in my relationships to be a sinner, what people are seeing is me being a God. When I sin against my wife, what is it the result from? It's the result of me being self-centered instead of other-centered. When I sin against my children, what is the, the result of? It's the result of me being centered on myself instead of them. The same thing is true of the children. You know, we, we sometimes talk about innocent children. There's no such thing as innocent children. Uh, you just need to look at what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in kindergartens and 
in grade schools and all over the place. It's now making the headlines because more kids have guns. But there is no more sin going on now in high schools than there was when I was in school. It's just that it expresses itself, itself in different ways. The thing, for instance, that is causing a great deal of this uh, problem of kids going home and getting guns and going back and shooting their fellow students, uh, a great deal of that is caused by the same thing that I experienced and that you experienced when you were in school. That is, uh, uh, disordered relationships. Say there was somebody at your school who was abused when they were smaller. They come to school and they don't act right. We say, well, you know, he, he, he lacks uh, a couple of bricks having a ton or whatever, you know, whatever expression we use. And, and since we have all of our bricks, we think, <laughs> then we think we have the right to make the guy feel even worse by picking on him or by calling him names. And we don't do this usually as individuals. You know, when, in, when individuals are picking on each other, uh, it's usually kind of a game. But the real difficult picking on people, bullying people, is something that happens in a group. And so if somebody goes to school for a whole year and he has never given any indication that he is worth a dime or that he is loved or accepted by anybody, uh, if that goes on too long, then you discover that, uh, that there are results to sin even in grade school, in junior high, and in high school. But the sin is not just the kid going out and getting a gun and shooting. The sin existed in the relationships before that occurred. You understand what I'm saying? So just like in a divorce, in a divorce, there may be sometimes a time when only one person is at fault. But I've never seen it. Almost always in divorce, somebody thinks that I'm not at fault, that the other person is at fault. But in every divorce, there's enough fault to go around. In other words, there's a sinful relationship. So divorce, which is just kind of a legal thing, is not the sin. The sin is what brings about the divorce. And in the same way, when, when you have a breakdown of community in the, in the kind of ways that are now happening in our schools, uh, the sin doesn't occur on May 22nd when somebody brings a gun up. The sin has been occurring all along. And so what we have to do is, is somehow try to recognize the sin in ourselves and not, uh, and not uh, put too much uh, attachment to uh, statements after the fact that, that all of the victims, all of the sides, the people on the sidelines, all of the observers are innocent because that's not the way human beings are. They're relatively innocent. There is no justification or excuse whatever for somebody getting a gun and going shooting another student. But that doesn't make the people that are left innocent. They're still sinners. And they may have contributed to some extent to the situation by not taking their own responsibility. Idolatry is well understood in the Bible as differing from the pure worship of Israel's God in the fact of its personification and objectification of the human will in contrast with the superhuman transcendence of the true God. When an idol is worshipped, man is worshipping himself, his desires, his purposes, his will. The ethics of idealism constitutes the chief rival of Christianity because so often the ethics of self-realization and Christian ethics have been identified as one in the same. 
And idealism is the chief rival of Christian ethics because what idealism calls the good, Christian ethics calls sin or idolatry. Now that is, that's one of the hardest things to explain in modern discussions. Particularly if you're in discussions about spirituality, you get to the point where you hear somebody saying something about his self-realization and how he's God and you think, Genesis, Genesis 2 and 3. That's exactly what Adam did that got us into all of our trouble. He thought he was God or he wanted to be God. And so that makes conversation between idealistic ethics and Christian ethics very troublesome, very very tense. And we'll uh, try to show how that goes when we talk about specific ethical issues.